Well, I want to thank Chancellor Christian and Reggie Williams and Laura Ellers for, for their visionary work in setting up this award and choosing me as the inaugural winner. <laughs> I am I'm greatly honored to receive an award that has Jack's name on it. I also want to thank Tarina Perry for all of her coordinating work in, get, in putting together uh, tonight's event and creating the institutional pieces um, to implement the vision so that the Fernesis Award will continue into the future. And finally, I want to thank my wife, Lisa, who, who proofreads my columns <laughs> and helps develop and articulate the ideas that are eventually put to print and loves me more than I deserve. <laughs> All right. Well, in this time of uh, the hardening of positions um, held within our social media bubbles, I've been thinking about the virtue of humility, how a modest or low view of one's own importance is a morally good or desirable quality. Now, I realize that a college professor talking about humility might strike some as a bit strange since humble college professor is an oxymoron, especially if they have a PhD. <laughs> okay. Just about all of the college professors I know definitely have opinions they are eager to share and debate. But it's okay to be confident as long as there's willingness to, to modify one's point of view if the evidence and logic is of the other side is compelling. There are three areas that uh, take up, uh, that, I, that I'd like to explore tonight in which humility plays an essential role. Science, religion, and free speech. Science and religion take up a large chunk of my life as an astronomy professor and lay leader of Wesley United Methodist Church and freedom of speech has allowed me to write opinion pieces in the Californian. In science and religion, there is a healthy awareness of the fallibility of human knowledge and intent. In the, in the two astronomy courses I teach, um, which are general education science courses designed to expose non-science majors to the scientific method or process of, of science through astronomy applications. In the introductory lectures, I tell my students that there are two basic assumptions that, uh, two basic assumptions of science, that there are fundamental rules that nature follows and that there is only one real way that nature is and operates. There are rules and the physical world always follows them. However, there is another basic assumption that is more germane to, to this talk. It's that our knowledge is, and, and understanding is always finite and incomplete. We explore because we don't know. Explanations and theories that correctly predict new results from new observations or experiments bring us closer to a true understanding of nature and the rules by which, by which it operates, but we know that we never finally arrive at that full understanding. Science is a human endeavor done by people who can make unintentional or even sometimes intentional mistakes. True science takes human fallibility into account by incorporating peer review as a key component of avoiding fooling ourselves. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman told his fellow scientists at the Galileo Symposium, 
Science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. <laughs> this is why peer review is a crucial part of the scientific method. Unlike the uh, echo chambers of our social media and politics today, peer review in the science research arena is a rigorous, critical process where claims are tested and either validated or thrown out. Peer review works best if the ones who critically analyze an explanation have an alternate explanation and try to poke holes in the other person's explanation. And sometimes that poking is pretty brutal. <laughs> the, the peer review happens at science conferences and in the pages of, of science journals. Now in the book, in his book, The Demon Haunted World, Carl Sagan noted that perhaps the sharpest distinction between science and pseudoscience is that science has a far keener appreciation of human imperfections and fallibility than does pseudoscience. The process of science takes into account that it is possible to arrive at various interpretations of the same data or facts and to develop various explanations of the underlying causes at work. Our culture, egos, and personal beliefs provide a filter through which we interpret the data and develop explanations. Decades of, of psychology and social science research have shown that our perceptions, intuitions, and even the reasoning about our intuition can lead even the best of us astray. That is why conclusions based solely or even mostly on eyewitness testimony are not acceptable in science, however harsh that may seem to the layman. The Innocence Project has shown that eyewitness identification has played a significant role in 75% of the convictions that were later overturned through DNA testing. Over 30 years of social science research have proven that eyewitness identification is often unreliable. Even victims of horrendous personal crimes have misidentified the perpetrators. Unfortunately, our memories are malleable. Initial uncertainties and recollection become strongly held recollection, become strongly held beliefs, bedrock certainties once we've had time to try to make sense of what happened. Our creativity can sometimes lead us astray. It can happen to the best of us, even the scientists. So because our culture, egos, and personal beliefs can filter our interpretations of the data, scientists lay their results open to the very critical scrutiny of others. And they agree to accept the criticism and resubmit their work when they have improved their argument through better data or give it up when the observations show that their idea does not have merit. They don't blame the establishment or make personal attacks. If the claim is valid, then it will hold up under examination by other scientists who have training and experience in that area of discovery. A true scientist will let others test the, the, the new idea or discovery because all scientists assume that there is an objective reality independent of us or our viewpoint and desires. Careful observations of the physical realm are the sole judge of scientific truth, which means that nature has the final veto power of an idea or claim discovery. Reality eventually kicks back. Finally, the, the peer review process gives the discovery or explanations credibility and, and fosters innovation as thoughts are shared and debated in an open competition of ideas. A scientist 
shouldn't try to have their science idea advanced by, by political means or legislated by politicians. Innovation from a competition of ideas is the key to the past success of the United States. Innovation can't happen if government bureaucrats and politicians control the review process. That would only solidify the status quo. Now in the realm of engineering, the virtue of humility is built into the design and test process. The engineering design process assumes that we're gonna make mistakes, forget something, or just not know about some force or process. Nature, physical reality, is far more complex than what we can invent or code into our, our virtual reality computer models. This is why we test, test, and retest the various parts of a system and then the system as a whole. Very often, prototyping small, simplified versions before moving on to a full-scale production model. Now, reflecting on the, the years of testing that uh, went into building and launching the James Webb Space Telescope, I can only imagine the, the stress and worry among the engineers over missing something crucial while they had the equipment here on the ground. They were keenly aware of the embarrassment of the Hubble Space Telescope's first two and a half years when it suffered from blurry vision. <laughs> now, in, in describing the errors that went into creating the defect in the, in the Hubble Space Telescope's primary mirror that produced the blurry data, senior project scientist for Hubble, David Leckron, stated in his book, Life with Hubble, that there are lessons about human arrogance, hubris, and the psychology of denial and rationalization. Lessons about the need for humility, curiosity, and a continual awareness that we humans are fallible creatures. The standard protocols of using several independent tests of the optics to find defects and using independent peer review teams to check each other were not done at crucial parts of the mirror fabrication process. Now, while the Hubble Space Telescope was designed to be periodically serviced uh, by astronauts in its low Earth orbit of about 335 miles altitude, There's a little tiny circle there <laughs> for Hubble Space Telescope's orbit there. That's in a low Earth orbit of about 335 miles altitude. The James Webb Space Telescope is operating in an orbit around the Sun-Earth L2 Lagrange gravitational ba balance point, which is about 932,000 miles from Earth, or almost four times farther out than any human has ever gone there is no servicing possible for that huge observatory. <laughs> so the, the complex origami folding that, to fit inside that skinny rocket and the complex unfolding process of deployment had to work flawlessly the first time. Tests and more tests of the system parts and the system as a whole were done. We test the systems because we know we make mistakes. And, and we can't predict all the things that could possibly go wrong. Another illustration of, uh, of humility in, that I saw in space exploration these past two to three years was uh, these, these large groups of really smart people doing, who were doing cutting edge science. They were following the CDC medical guidelines for reducing the spread of COVID-19. NASA launched and landed the Perseverance rover on Mars during the pandemic. No one came down with COVID-19 from their work because they followed the public health protocols. SpaceX 
sent humans up to the International Space Station for the first time during the pandemic. We saw all the people in mission control and during the press briefings spaced apart and masked. Just as each of them relies on those with expertise in some other part of the system, they rely on the expertise of medical experts to guide their interactions with other members of the team. They know that being an expert in some field of science or engineering in space exploration does not make them an expert in epidemiology or public health. I have a PhD in astrophysics, but you don't want me giving you medical advice and or working on your car. Back in spring of 2019, in one of my astronomy columns, I wrote about the flat Earth idea that was gaining ground back then. Little did we know that it was a mild foretaste of what we were going to see with the mainstreaming of QAnon and the 2020 election conspiracy theories. In spring 2019, I wrote that it ultimately comes down to who do you trust to bring you information about things you haven't seen yourself. The flat earth leaders say we shouldn't trust anyone and not to believe science experts in our research and education institutions because they're all in on the conspiracy of a spherical earth. Well, I scratch my head and wonder then, why should I trust the flat earth leader? <laughs> I talked about the, the trust I held in the existence of other countries that you know, I hadn't been to myself based on the experiences of family and friends who had visited them. And, and the seemingly fantastic, as in fantasy theory, of, uh, of quantum tunneling that our computers use and at which at least a third of our global economy relies. I ended the piece saying, science is a human endeavor relying on the experiences of many, many people to build up the picture of how the universe works. No one person can figure it all out by themselves. Even Einstein relied on the advice of his doctor for medical issues, for example. BC has some, some great philosophy faculty who will be happy to probe more of this with you if you want. <laughs> well, I'll use that to, to close out the, the science part of this talk and, and move on to the, the virtue of humility in, in religion. As I mentioned before, I'm an active member of Wesley United Methodist Church and I've done a lot of reading and studying of the Bible of my Christian faith. In his book, The Serpent in the Garden, The Bible for Unbelievers, Jack Hernandez described his lifelong interest in the Bible, first as a believer growing up, where it played such a central role in informing his identity and outlook, and later as an unbeliever when he taught the Bible as literature in college from the perspective of true appreciation of it as literature. In the, the second essay of his book, Jack writes that unbelievers often ignore or disregard the Bible unaware of its power, beauty, and effect on our history, literature, and language. The B-I-B-L-E has meant a lot to me as a believer and unbeliever, as a human trying to understand his short span of years, trying to live rightly and fully. So I want to say to my kindred unbelievers, look at this book, this wonderful book. Break through its theological shell and take from it the kernel, the meat that nourishes the spirit. So although I read the Bible as a believer, I think Jack would still appreciate the comments um, I'm going to make about the wisdom of being humble expressed in the Bible. Also, my oldest daughter asked if I would be including scriptures from other faiths in my talk. I answered that I don't presume to know enough of the other faith scriptures to speak intelligently about them. So I'm going to stick with what I know, and we're all aware of that limitation. She was okay with that. I hope you'll be too. <laughs> 
Over and over again, there is the wisdom of shared of being humble before God. Here are a few that uh, stand out for me. The prophet named Isaiah, speaking for God, declares, My plans aren't your plans, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my plans than your plans. Another prophet named Micah spoke out against showy displays of worship in a time when the powerful enriched themselves at the expense of the poor. Instead, God has told you, human one, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. Several centuries later, a man named Jesus would show how to live out a life of this, of this in action. Upon it being addressed as good teacher, Jesus replied, why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. There is the wisdom of humility before God and the wisdom of humility before each other. Of the over 600 commandments and rules to live by, Jesus singled out two. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. And on the night before he was to be killed by a shameful execution, he knew what was coming. And he pleaded with God, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Take this cup of suffering from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. In that same Bible are plenty of stories of very imperfect pe humans who screw up and stories of the destruction and death that happens when we set up false idols of our own thinking. From the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis to the stories of the first generation of leaders in the Christian movement, the Bible is chock full of people acting foolishly, selfishly, and arrogantly, with only some of them learning from their mistakes and redirecting their lives back to compassion and justice. When imperfect people turn away from the path of pride and turn around to the path of humility, and loving those whom God loves, the world is transformed. Well, given this backdrop of scripture and the long history of tradition extolling the uh, humility as a capital virtue, you can see why I get a bit disappointed when those who say they are Christian believers, especially church leaders, wield their faith to exclude others and proclaim that they alone know the mind of God. You'd think that people who worship an infinite, eternal, all-powerful God who created the entire universe of trillions of galaxies, you'd think they'd be a, a, would be a bit more humble in deciding what God thinks about certain theological matters instead of being so certain that they have the precise answers of what God would say. Well, although there are plenty of jerks in Christianity today, there are also plenty of Christians, as in other faiths, who do work for justice with compassion, drawing upon their faith to create positive change, even in times of, of deep darkness that seem so hopeless. Being careful observers of human nature, the good and the bad, being, uh, being wise as serpents while being innocent as doves, enables us to name the darkness and rise up in resistance against the oppressive darkness to effect change in community with others.
It's humility that enables me to understand and therefore keep going when, when bad things happen to good people. The laws of nature mean that there will always be storms, floods, earthquakes, and microbes killing and hurting the wise and the foolish alike. No one is above the laws of nature. However, it's a lot harder to keep that perspective when it's people intentionally doing horrible things to good people. And we rightly wonder, why does a loving God allow such evil to continue? Evil that, that hurts even, even those who anyone would call holy and good. In a world where there is free will, where there is choice, there will be some who choose death and curse instead of life and blessing. The books of, of Job and Ecclesiastes are included in the canon to provide an, an alternate view to the more popular God of justice, compassion, and reason. In the first annual Levin Lecture at St. John's in, in July of 2012, Jack Hernandez described the book of Job as a, as a poetry of power. In the book, Job is a, a righteous, prosperous, generous man who is made to suffer. Job's friends tell him that he must have done something wrong, so he must repent to have the punishment go away. Job denies any wrongdoing and demands an audience with God to argue his case. God finally appears and essentially repudiates the wisdom of justice of Job and his friends, replacing it with the wisdom of God's power and the human inability to understand God's ways. So this is God's, uh, God speaking to Job. Who are you to question my wisdom with your ignorant, empty words? Stand up now like a man and answer the questions I ask you. Were you there when I made the world? Have death's gates been revealed to you? Do you know heaven's laws or can you impose its rule on earth? If you know so much, tell me about it. Are you trying to prove that I am unjust to put me in the wrong and yourself in the right? Well, as a, as a logical, um, physics-minded person, I really do not like this apparent violation of cause and effect. <laughs> violation of justice with reasoned fair play. Job didn't deserve his suffering. And God told him that humans simply cannot understand the why of it. We would all like an answer to why, the, why is there evil and injustice in this world, as well as what is the, the meaning of our lives and how we should live out the one life that we have. The books of Job and Ecclesiastes deal with these questions, and they address them by having us encounter the mystery with humility. Well, what do we do with that? How should we live with these unanswerable questions? In the book of Luke, the 13th chapter begins with, with two horrible things happening in which many people die. One is human caused and the other is nature caused. Some who were present on that occasion told Jesus about the Galileans whom Pilate had killed while they were offering sacrifices. He replied, do you think the suffering of these Galileans proves that they were more sinful than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. What about those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the other Jerusalem, those living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lives, you will die just as they did. 
don't try to assign blame or think you're better than others. Suffering can either destroy us or it can add meaning to our life. Examine your own life to see if you're living a life that clearly shows you love God with your entire being and your neighbor as yourself. In times of, of darkness, name the darkness and rise up in resistance against that oppressive darkness to affect change in community with others. Now, what I've talked about humility in the religious realm so far has mostly focused on humility towards God, but there is also the requirement of humility toward one another, the love of neighbor command. There's also plenty of scripture and longstanding teaching about humility in our interactions with each other. Now, I haven't quoted anything from the letters section of the New Testament, so here's to me a couple of samples from the evangelist Paul of Tarsus. In his letter to the community in Rome, okay, the capital city of the Roman Empire, who, like the rest of Roman society at that time, lived in an honor-shame culture that was particularly acute, so close to the seat of uh, the emperor, Paul writes in the 12th chapter of his letter, because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable, since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. And consider everyone is equal, and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. And near the end of his life, five years later, he wrote this to the community in Philippi that's in the northeast uh, part of Greece. Don't do anything for selfish purposes, but with humility, think of, of others as better than yourselves. Instead of each person watching out for their own good, watch out what is better for others. In the, in the current day United States, affecting change in community with others will very likely find us working with those who don't share our particular religious or political beliefs. The, the popular media focuses on the intolerance of certain branches of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, but ignores or just doesn't know um, about the embracing of religious diversity and pluralism in other branches of those faiths, both today as well as throughout the past many centuries. Christian writers such as Karl Rahner and C.S. Lewis wrote from an inclusivist perspective, and others, such as Diana Eck of Harvard's Pluralism Project, come from a pluralist perspective. She describes pluralism in this way. First, pluralism is not diversity alone, but the energetic engagement with diversity. Second, pluralism is not just tolerance, but the active seeking of understanding across lines of difference. Third, pluralism is not relativism, but the encounter of commitments. Fourth, pluralism is based on dialogue. So there is a commitment to the value of diversity and engaging with others from different religious traditions not to convert them to one's own faith, but to learn from them and thereby deepen one's own religious understanding. However, what, what may be of more interest today is the, uh, the political question of, of how we organize religiously diverse societies. The solution seems to be some form or other of secularism that separates church from state while guaranteeing religious freedom. Now, the strong form of secularism in the time of the Enlightenment appealed to the framers of the US Constitution. 
They felt that public discourse should be free from religious language and commitment. Keep your religion private and approach public discourse as a purely rational moral agent. A weaker form of secularism called secularization by Jeffrey Stout recognizes the reality that people are not unencumbered, free, rational agents who simply choose their beliefs. Secularization means that the participants in a given discursive practice are not in a position to take for granted that their interlocutors, those taking part in the discussion, are making the same religious assumptions they are. People come to a conversation with different assumptions and, and different sources of authority of ethics and politics. Public discourse will always have a combination of normal discourse where there are shared assumptions and conversational improvisation when assumptions are not shared. Tyler Roberts uh, from, Gr from Grinnell College described one possible improvisation this way. In the abortion debate, it's possible for the atheist supporter of abortion rights to try to enter into the mindset of the Christian opponent to explore with them Christian reasons for opposing such rights to see whether they're internally consistent, but, to all, but also to draw their attention to Christian reasoning that some might use to defend abortion rights. Similarly, the Christian could point out the atheistic reasons to outlaw abortion, and they could engage with one another on the basis of trying to get into each other's worldview and arguments. This approach certainly won't guarantee resolution, but it will keep the conversation going. For Stout, democracy is a tradition, not just a set of rules for a representative government, voting and free elections. <clears throat> In order for, for a democracy to work, its citizens need to have the character, the, the habits, disposition, and skills to commit themselves to being informed and willing to give reasons for their views without resorting to violence. It takes humility of, of each of its members to live and work in community for public discourse to work. Freedom of, of speech can improve society only when the people engaged in the, the debate or dialogue have a sense of humility and open-mindedness so that learning happens. However, what I've found more often is that defenses of free speech are centered around the desire to get one's own opinion out there and not so much in listening to another point of view. That's why we hear people shouting about the freedom of speech to speak their minds and then shouting over others with a contrary point of view. I don't give a damn about your rights, but I sure do give a damn about mine. <laughs> now, I do understand that you know, there is sometimes the need to shout, especially when telling truth to power. Those in power want to maintain the status quo of the decision-making structures and thought that keep them in power. And trouble arises when those in power use that power to silence the opposition or shout over the opposition or plug up the ears of potential listeners. Trouble arises from the other side when they've over-practiced shouting at those in power that shouting is all they know how to do. They see vast conspiracies of intentional planning when the reality is the result of bumbling human beings reacting with poor information. Trouble also arises when one group thinks that only their viewpoint is based on reasoned logic. So a reasonable dialogue should naturally lead to agreement with their position, and any disagreement must be because the other group is morally deficient. 
It's a sort of a, a Lake Wobegon of Garrison Keillor, a Lake Wobegon effect of, you know, it's, that's the place where all the children are above average. Um, here, everyone in the group thinks they are moderate and balanced on the issue, so those others are extremists. The reality is more likely that both sides have viewpoints based on reasoned logic from different premises or life experiences or living situations. Nowadays, uh, we need to also add that different groups can have very different news sources uh, thanks to social media. Each of us is a mixed bag of honorable, selfish, loving, hating, joyful, and sad qualities and tendencies. Now, it's easy to remember this in the, the people we call friends, but it, it's hard to do that with those we don't spend time with, and it's extremely hard to do that with those we do know but disagree with. One assumption behind freedom of speech is that one group, or one person or one group of people does not have all of the right answers. Another assumption is that uh, groups do not share the, the same life experiences relevant to a particular issue, and I think we can safely agree that no group is morally pure and infallible. Even if someone is, is acting with the best of intentions to help others, but through just their own resources, they usually don't have all the information needed to make the best decision. We can't make progress by holding the opposing side in contempt or hate. So when we name the injustice and work in community to correct the injustice, we need to remember that persons on the other side are not the enemy. Very often, if we can get people to move from shouting their positions to dialoguing about their interests, okay, that is the reasons behind their uh, positions, meaningful progress will happen. We find a way to move forward. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I'll conclude with another aspect of freedom of speech, the value of the competition of ideas. Innovation from a competition of ideas is the key to the past success of the United States. When power and domination are valued over humility, the competition of ideas will slow down. Innovation will become stagnation and fragmentation will happen. Even if a, a particular de a decision from a democratic process is, is not rationally the, you know, the, the absolute best decision to be made, it will be good enough for, for people to be willing to cooperate to carry out the decision. As long as people are, feel heard and valued, they will usually voluntarily cooperate to carry out the group's decision. If, if democracy in the United States is replaced by one group getting de domination over other groups, then high gas and food prices will be the least of our worries. Thank you very much.